Well, congratulations, Bryant, on getting into several top med schools. So you got into Yale Medical School, you got into Wash U MD PhD, and you got into Johns Hopkins MD PhD, where you decided to go. So we're very proud of you and excited there. So a hearty congratulations to you. Thank you. I want to begin by asking what first got you interested in medicine and what sustained that interest throughout your years of college? Yeah. So honestly, for me, a very serious pursuit of medicine actually started kind of in college and started as I was thinking about where I was going to go to school. So I'd I'd always sort of had medicine as a possibility in the back of my mind. I think my dad sort of planted that in some ways in me. He thought I would make a good doctor and he told me that. Um, And so that sort of started me thinking. I also had a lot of experience with animal husbandry and animal care. And I considered becoming a vet at one point. Kind of put that aside as I became very interested in in other pursuits, math and physics in particular. Mm -hmm. So I actually applied to a bunch of other schools before I even heard about Sattler, and I was intending to go study math or physics. And heard about Sattler, got intrigued by it for other reasons, really, more the the educational philosophy and the discipleship program here. And then when I was coming and visiting and hearing about the school and realized, well, they don't have a math or a physics department, (laughs) um, that's sort of when I started considering biology and the medical track more seriously. And it was in conversations with you and others where... In some ways, it was a very big picture kind of like meta analysis where I was like, wow, I really want to do something that's impactful. And I want to study a field that that I can tangibly impact people's lives. And I don't know exactly where I fit in that spectrum, but I was excited about biology and excited about studying the human body for, for that reason. And then that grew over my time at Sattler as I got exposed to to the intricacies of the body in in the classroom as I got involved in research and and got to experience the science side. And then as I got clinical experience, and a lot of that even came post, post-college. I was still kind of feeling things out, unsure about exactly where I would land during my time at Sattler. And then I had an experience in Honduras where I spent three weeks in a very intense clinical setting that that helped me sort of like get a feel for clinical the clinical side, the medical side, I knew I was very interested in science, but that was a big part of kind of helping me decide, yeah, I want to do medicine. And I also love the research. Um, you mentioned that I got into the, the MD PhD program. So I'm interested in both the science and the research and also the clinical practice and taking things from hopefully it's called bench to bedside, as you know, <laughs> taking things from the, the, the research lab to the clinic. Mm. So, so how did attending Sattler prepare you to get into medical school? Yeah, there, are, there are many, many ways. <laughs> uh, it's it's been a really, uh, it's been a really formative experience for me to be here, and I I have the opportunities that I have because I came to Sattler and almost exclusively across the board. Um, so, I'd say one of the one of the biggest ways is actually something you might not consider, which is how the classes are structured to prepare students for the MCAT. So I MCAT, for those, those of you who don't know who are listening, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, the MCAT is the obviously the medical college entrance exam mm-hmm. where all students that are trying to enter medical school have to take it. And it's a pretty high stakes exam and doing well is an important threshold for being considered by top institutions. And especially coming from a, a school where nobody's heard of Sattler, right? It's not like I'm going to Harvard or some other undergraduate institution where people really know the name and that can carry people places. That s- score is very important for me to, to be considered by good, good schools. And so the class structure leading up to the summer of junior year in order to take the MCAT was incredibly helpful for preparing me to do well on that exam. I actually studied almost embarrassingly little and did very well. And I think that that was mostly due to the thoughtfulness that went into the course structure at Sattler. I think beyond that, um, there are just so many things about the the personal uh, investment in each student here at Sattler mm-hmm. that allows people to succeed. And it, it means that you have, although the the like sort of raw institutional resources, like there aren't research labs here, the personal investment that you get from professors and the connections that you get through professors here 
and their willingness to vouch for you and make sure that you're, you, you know, you're getting the opportunities that you need is really huge for getting the experiences, both for sort of like a resume perspective and then also from like a, I need this experience in order to understand what it is that I enjoy and where I want to go perspective. And that's been hugely formative for me. Experiences that I would never have gotten going to a school in Kansas without the same level of connections and resources that you get with Sattler's position here in Boston mm -hmm. and also Sattler's investment, very small student body and investment in individual students. Yeah, that makes sense. And so let's let's transition into that topic of labs and research mm -hmm. and all of that. So how did being in downtown Boston, where we are right now, help you mm -hmm. to get into research labs and, and the opportunities that you availed yourself of? As you know, Boston is like the... <laughs> It's, it's probably the premier research city in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the opportunities here are endless. You have research hospitals and universities, research universities, and it's just an incredible plethora of opportunities here that really isn't like anywhere else in the world, honestly. Um, and the hardest part is breaking into that, right? Like you need, it, it takes a little bit to sort of find an opportunity where you can plug in and invest. And I think that's where... Um, Sattler actually really helped. So I made a connection through Dr. Bennett, a professor here at Sattler, um, and emailed a professor and was able to to secure a place in their lab, I think primarily because of Dr. Bennett's recommendation. Um, and so the opportunity to be here at Sattler and leverage those connections and and sort of break in in that way was really powerful. But then once you're in, the world is at your fingertips and you've you've got so many opportunities here like nowhere else. And if you're and if you're eager and ambitious and and care about making those connections and are willing to sort of stick your neck out and be excited about what's going on, you can once once you're in, it's like you can you can make new connections and and find the opportunities that you want. And that's been really important for me. You you use two words there, eager and ambitious, which are good words. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people come to college and they're they're intimidated or unsure about how you break into the research world. You've published in some well-respected journals now. Congratulations there. What advice would you give students on navigating this world and specifically transitioning from just being a student in a classroom to a contributor in a lab? Yeah, this is a it's a good question and it's a hard one because a lot of it is luck, right? Like who you where you where you plug in, what labs you get involved in. It's a lot of it is I shouldn't say luck. It's out of your control. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are things you just can't control about as an undergraduate student about what projects you're going to be on mm -hmm. and where you're publishing. The things that you can control, right? The things that you can control are kind of the things that I mentioned. You can be eager, an eager beaver, as my father would say, <laughs> and you can be ambitious, right? And you can you can be the person that says, yes, I want to, I'm excited about it and I want to do, and I want to do it and I want to work on this and I want to be invested in it. And I think there's sort of a, I think, I think that researchers can sense that kind of excitement and that eagerness to be involved mm -hmm. and they're more inclined to then give you responsibility and give you, and give you sort of like ownership over projects if you're excited about it and you, and they can tell that you're not just sort of there to check a box to do something for your medical school career, but if you're there because you're excited about what they're doing and you're invested in it and and so that's the thing you can control, right? right? And I think that pressing into saying yes and and taking on projects and being eager and excited about it is are, are some of the main things to be, keep in mind and to be really to be thinking about. Because, well, I'll, I'll add one more piece, which is science is super slow, as you know. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, people talk about making big discoveries, and those are typically discoveries that there there are high points along the course of a career, but they're typically discoveries that come over the course of an entire career, right? Mm -hmm. Like people make seminal work over the course of a lifetime, not over the course of a summer. At the same time, a lot of those baby steps are really exciting and and learning to celebrate the the like the learning process and the little granular steps while keeping in mind that big picture of what you're working toward is is I think a part of staying excited and engaged. So if you focus too much on like, I'm not in this project going to make any big groundbreaking steps, it can be a discouraging. You're like, why am I even doing this? Right. And it's easy to become discouraged. But if you're focusing on the process for you of learning 
and keeping in mind that you're part of something bigger and getting excited about that bigger sort of engine of discovery. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a real key to being eager and ambitious and excited and being invested in what you're doing. Yeah. And you, you said something earlier that there's no substitute for just passion mm -hmm. in like you care about the results, you're excited about the field. It's not, mm -hmm. as you said, checking off a yeah. box. Yeah. And generally speaking, what I've observed is that if you have an intrinsic passion for discovery, science, helping people, people sense that. And not just that lab that you're in mm -hmm. is, it, it will, will notice that and observe that, but other opportunities will open up. And you've mm -hmm. been in a couple of labs in your time here. Mm -hmm. And eventually as you navigate your way through the world, often opportunities to make more substantial contributions and publications yeah. will, will happen. For sure. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that you're touching on is the power of connections right. and and understanding and utilizing those. And that's that's sort of been the operating principle that I've used to think about how to select labs and how to kind of like move from one lab to another. And so, like I said, I, I got into the lab that I did at the recommendation of Dr. Bennett, someone I knew and could vouch for that lab environment. And I trusted to sort of... Um, help me make an informed decision about what would be a healthy lab space and and a lot of opportunity there as well. And then from that lab, I made connections with another researcher right. who then became my employer. Right. And so I, I sort of channeled the experiences that I had there and I was, you know, my antennas were up and I was looking for opportunities, channeled those experiences and those connections to then dovetail into the next lab experience that I had, um, which turned out to be a really great decision. And I it was primarily guided by the fact that that I had some sort of like connection to that person and I was able to utilize that to unearth this other opportunity. And mm -hmm. so I think I think that I think that something that I didn't fully appreciate about research and the whole academic system and basically everything in life is how important connections are. And, right. And tapping into those connections to provide opportunities. Yeah, I, I often say that a lot of people wrongly think that research is looking at a, under a microscope right. all day long, right. and they miss it. As much of success yeah. in research is from people and yeah. developing relationship yeah. as it is from just doing your actual experiments and yeah, absolutely. And, learning. and I think my I've learned a lot about this from my boss. He's a perfect case study of this, where he doesn't even have his own lab space. Like he's kind of operating in a couple of different labs, mm -hmm. and he manages teams of people to basically enact his ideas. <laughs> he's almost like a little mini PI without a lab. Um, and he's incredibly effective at it. He's really good at keeping different projects going and he's incredibly a profound idea generator and is excited about lots of different projects. And it's, I've learned just an incredible amount about collaboration and science and the people part of the job through working with him. That's great. I want to I want to go back to something you said earlier about Sattler and your decision to come here. And and this can be broader than just science and and research and being on a on a pre-med track now getting into medical school. What's unique about Sattler that someone should know who's thinking about applying? There there are obviously many unique things about sort of the the faith aspects here and those were really influential in my decision to come to Sattler. Because it's a med school talk, I'll probably focus on on some other aspects that are more pertinent to that. Um, I think the main thing is it's small and new, right? Those are the unique things about Sattler when you look at when you look at sort of the landscape of colleges that are available to you. And there are definitely downsides to that, right? Like there aren't the same level of institutional resources that you might find. We don't have labs here. Um, but there are lots of upsides to that that I've found to be incredibly rewarding. And I've touched on a couple of those, mm -hmm. but you just get an incredible amount of institutional support here and personal investment in your success that you that you don't get at these big research universities. In fact, you don't get at all until you go to the level of like individual labs. I've experienced something similar in my 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 lab that I've joined at it's at, at, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, I feel a similar level of support to what I felt here at Sattler when I was a student. But that's not something that most students experience from in the classroom and in sort of some of the most formative steps of their educational journey. And I think it's really powerful and unique to Sattler mm -hmm. that there's this really close community and a lot of trust and an assumption that like 
people have your back and they're willing to go above and beyond in order to make your education and then your next career steps a success. Um, and especially in the context of the the discipleship and the Christian community here, I think that's a really powerful, unique environment. The second thing is that it's new, which means I think, <laughs> I think it just compounds that like investment in, in the success of the individual students, because it's not sort of like a, there's not, um, a, I'd say a layer of tradition or sort of like, it, there's a whole, there's a whole set of like vigor and excitement about the future of students mm -hmm. here that comes with being a new enterprise that I find to be very rewarding as I found to be very rewarding as a student. And I continue to be excited about how the institution is investing in students because of that. So one of the things that a lot of people wonder as they're thinking about medicine is there's a lot of pre-med requirements. You yeah. general chemistry, organic chemistry, biology, genetics, all these, all these requirements, math. Mm -hmm. And then here we have a lot of additional yeah. courses, Hebrew, Greek, uh, church history, fundamental texts, doctrines, et cetera. There's a lot there that's quite a bit more than other students would be doing if you were to say be a pre-med at yeah. a, a local state school, for example. For you, and and speaking to those who are thinking about coming, how does one keep your 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 ability to excel in difficult subjects like organic chemistry, like general chemistry that are, are typically weed out classes as, mm -hmm. as people often say, and yet attend to discipleship while in college, attend to church, to relationships, because in a lot of ways, being a Christian, mm -hmm. it, it, in a sense, like demands more of us than somebody else who's just got their 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 narrow sights set on say I just want to get into medical school. So if you could speak to that, I would love to hear your your perspective on that. Yeah, I don't I don't claim to have done this uh, by no means flawlessly, and I I think I have things that I would change looking back at my undergraduate mm -hmm. time, probably spending more time doing things besides school. Frankly. Um, I do think it's very possible uh, to do to balance the demands of school, especially pre med, and doing well in those pre med classes, and also the the social and and like church demands mm -hmm. that come with being a Christian, and being invested in the church and plugged in in the in a church and invested in the kingdom. In terms of how to do that well, I think. I think one of the things that's really important is <laughs> this is this is going to sound very sort of like cliche self help, but rhythms and and physical well being mm -hmm. are really important for being able to maintain a consistent like study healthy study patterns and healthy rhythms of life. So sleep, exercise, and eating mm -hmm. are like really really key. And it's not about exactly what you're doing; it's about having some pattern of regular and consistent sleep, exercise, and mm -hmm. eating, and and I think that that provides some of that physical health can really provide a threshold, a foundation for mental health, and then give you sort of a, a lot of, uh, in some ways can provide a foundation for spiritual health too, because you have the resources that you need to spread yourself across mm -hmm. and all the things that you're doing. Um, the other thing is Anki and being consistent. Mm -hmm. um, flashcards. I think that was the other big thing that helped me prepare for the MCAT was I was consistent in keeping up with class flashcards after the class is finished. And so I stayed fresh on some of those things that rather than having a ton of cram work at the end, I was able to to really ingrain some of those, learn the things that I learned, I was able to carry with me. And that compounds in later classes because you remember the things, you don't have to relearn the things for the classes. Mm -hmm. So you actually spend less time in each class. And then when it comes time to take the MCAT, you'll be way better off yeah. and you won't have to spend nearly as much time cramming. Yeah. Um, different people are going to be different on this. Like there just are different ability levels and being realistic with yourself about where you fall in that ability spectrum and adjusting your goals accordingly is important because I think it can lead to burnout if you're like, I have to keep up with X, Y, or Z person and then you don't and it's discouraging. Um, but those are some of the things that I yeah. think are important and um, especially, especially the rest. I think that the rest piece, the sleep and the and the spiritual rest, is really important for staying in it for the long haul. Yeah, amen to that. I I think that's well said. And 
I will uh, often remember with fondness our basketball games. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> hikes and going to <laughs> yeah various uh, uh, beautiful spots and enjoying nature together. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a it's an excellent uh, piece of advice to give to to someone thinking about college. Any final advice for pre med students on how to prepare themselves for a demanding few years and a competitive med school admission process? The importance of connections, I think, was hammered home to me even during the medical school admissions process. So I I heard, especially from Johns Hopkins, I have a lot of my science mentors and the people who wrote me recommendation letters are Johns Hopkins. Uh, they have Johns Hopkins connections. They were either faculty there or studied there. And that was something that came through again and again, even during my interview process. And then as I got an acceptance and what what people mentioned when they talked about why I was a good candidate for Johns Hopkins was people who were here and that we think highly of spoke highly of you. And so that to me underscored like right. <laughs> this was a huge part of this is probably a huge part of why I got into Johns Hopkins. And that's not something that you can, you know, that that comes from taking a test or from any of these other things that are sort of very individual. It comes from making good relationships with people and and following through in a way that they respect you and are willing to vouch for you. And I think that's really, really important. The final thing that I that I'll mention that that I wish I had done better actually. If you're invested in medicine and you want to pursue medicine and you know that coming into college, there are all sorts of things you can do to really help ease the application process. For me, I love learning and I loved classes. And so some of the things that some people find challenging or like weed out for me were invigorating and exciting and I love them. What really nipped me was the actual application process and writing and coming up with the material and 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 like putting together a compelling narrative and that was both true to my experience and concise. And that was really, really challenging for me. And looking back, I realized that that's partly because I wasn't sure that I wanted to do medicine when I came in. And I even sort of, you know me, I like to keep my options open and I resist bottlenecking or narrowing too quickly. And and so I think the thing that I would do in hindsight, if I knew, if I, knew I was gonna go into medicine, when I entered school, I would start taking note of experiences, keeping them, keeping like a medical application journal where when I have an experience that's meaningful to me with respect to patient care or a research experience, or even just something as simple as a sort of like a human connection with someone that I think might want to be something that can, I talk about because it is impactful to me on my application, jotting it down a few things that I can remember and 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 being thoughtful about that because when it comes time to write your applications, it'll be incredibly helpful for you mm-hmm. to have some sort of things to pull from that it's not like you sitting there for hours like, what was, oh yeah, that was a meaningful experience, mm-hmm. but what happened exactly? How did it go? How, you know, it'll save you a lot of time and energy. Now, the thing that I would caution you against is I don't, I don't think you should live life through the perspective of med school applications. So it's not like a go through life like, thinking about medical school and always like thinking about checkbox like experiences for medical school i think it's much more a retrospective thing like as part of your thoughtful moments Mm -hmm. (laughs) like have that be a component where you're preparing in some way for writing some of the most high stakes things that you'll write in the course of your your career and your education and that's a really helpful I think that would have been very helpful for me to ease the application process, which was, I think, the most difficult part of the whole, the whole process for me. So, well, thanks, Bryant, um, and congratulations again. We're so excited that you're in the program. It's a fully funded program. It is. Yeah, you get not just a scholarship, but they pay you to go to school, which is amazing. Um, I, I was once a MD PhD student many years ago, and it was some of the best years of my life. And so, I'm thrilled that you're in the program and. Looking forward to having you back at Sattler, um, continuing to speak into the students' lives and, and build a community. So congratulations again. Thank you. I am very grateful, and I consider it a gift of God in many ways. He's paved the way for me to, to be in this program, and and very grateful to the community here at Sattler for en- enabling enabling me to, to, to embark on this 
next journey. I do have minor PTSD from being right here because this is where I did most of my interviews. So <laughs> there's a little, it's a much more congenial environment than uh, than that was. So I'm grateful for that. But good. It, I, I think I'm positive. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> all right. All the best. Thank you. <laughs>